A winter day in Austin, Texas was just amazing. The air temperature was 20 degrees, there was a light westerly breeze, and it was a perfect day. The evening was even more charming. The moon was full, and the temperature dropped to about 10 degrees by 8 o'clock in the evening. Everything turned out perfectly for Henry Kahn and his wife Melanie, who had front row tickets to the Florida Georgia Line concert at the Moody Center. The 33-year-old couple, who had been married for almost five years, were looking forward to the upcoming evening. Valentine's Day was approaching, and residents of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, were preparing to celebrate it a week earlier. But the cold weather did not help their plans. The air temperature was about 12 degrees. There was a lot of snow on the ground, and it was expected that it would not have time to melt yet. Despite the cold, Henry, Melanie, and their friends were determined to go on a date with Tyler Hubbard, Brian Kelly, and the rest of the team. How they would cope with such weather was a mystery. At the last minute, Henry received a call asking him to come to Sioux Falls urgently to fix a critical computer problem at the Sanford Biomedical Center. The failure affected the neonatal unit, which participated in a nationwide research project. Despite the fact that Henry was the leading information technology specialist at his company and rarely traveled on business trips, he knew how important Sanford was to him, the company's third largest client. He quickly booked a plane ticket from Ayus for Thursday in order to be on the spot as soon as possible. He had a scheduled flight back to Austin at 6 in the morning, which was supposed to take him home 10 hours before the start of the concert. But by 3 o'clock in the morning, there was already a layer of snow on the ground, and it was still coming. The airline's app on his mobile phone started sending notifications about delays, and as a result, the flight was cancelled. Despite the fact that his job paid well and was worth every penny, Henry knew that his boss would not be happy if he booked another flight home. Therefore, he did not sleep, but looked for alternative options. Having saved thousands of dollars for his company, which would have cost a charter, he decided to try this option. By five in the morning, it became obvious that flights would not take place in the near future due to the ongoing snowfall and a drop in temperature to 15 degrees. Some even called it the storm of the decade. Henry's only thought was, damn it. Around nine in the morning, he dialed a speed dial number on his phone to call Melanie's office. Kim, the assistant, picked up the phone after the second call and put him through to Melanie. Hi, baby, I can't wait for tonight. What time will you be home? Melanie asked. Have you checked the weather in Sioux Falls, Henry? No, I knew you were going there, but I didn't follow. What's going on? She asked. Unfortunately, a huge amount of snow has fallen, and more is expected to fall today. All flights have been canceled. I'm really sorry, kid. I was really looking forward to tonight. I've been working a lot lately, and I was happy to spend a romantic weekend together. Your job can be very tiring sometimes. I understand that you travel only a few times a year and only if absolutely necessary. This time you had a serious crisis with a client. I know we haven't been together much lately, but you're the one spending the crazy hours, not me. My job allows us to enjoy the wonderful Texas lifestyle. You're absolutely right, Henry. It's just that we've been spending more time apart than together lately. I admit that in many ways it's my fault. I've put a lot of effort into reaching the partner level, which means I have to prioritize. You have the flexibility to control most of your schedule and keep it under control. I'm working on it, but it will take about a year before I can manage my work time. I miss you and our time together. Me too, baby. Maybe you and Sue will have fun together and go to the show. I have front row tickets that I don't want to sell so I can arrange for a car to pick you up and drop you off. Don't let your mood spoil your enjoyment of the concert. Melanie hesitated but eventually offered to sell the tickets and stay at home to watch the concert online. She mentioned that she could easily sell tickets through their Ticketmaster account and said she wouldn't want to go alone without him. Despite Henry's insistence, he advised her to go and have fun. He noted how great she looked in the new boots, reminding her how stylishly they decorated her. After a short pause, she finally agreed. They exchanged, I love you, and ended the conversation. 
A few minutes later, Melania found a disposable mobile phone in her bag and dialed a familiar number. As soon as the call connected, she greeted the other person joyfully. Hi, how was your day? Maybe I have something to cheer you up? Henry just called and said he was stuck in Sioux Falls, South Dakota because of a severe snowstorm. Can you imagine how badly he chose his time? Yes, good luck to him. Anyway, I still have two tickets for the evening, but my husband will be in the north. Is your wife Diana still in Memphis visiting her parents? It is wonderful. How about we spend the evening together? I can't wait to try on a new denim skirt and boots. I'll order a taxi to pick you up at home, and we'll hit the road. How do you like this option? Of course, I will definitely order a dark taxi with tinted windows. Let's have a night party after the concert. I'll meet you around 7. I'm so excited. Melanie worked all day and was able to leave the office by 4.30 in the evening. She couldn't wait to soak in the tub for an hour before the concert. Before she left, she called her best friend, Susan O'Connor. They first met in her first year at the company and immediately became close. With an age difference of just one year, they became friends. They had a lot in common. Hey Susie, could you do me a favor? Mel asked. What's going on, Mel? I'll be happy to help if I can, Susie replied. If Henry ever asks you about how we spent the evening at the Florida Georgia Line concert, just say that everything was wonderful, Mel said. Susie is shocked. What the hell, Mel? Are you still dating that jerk, David? Mel giggled and admitted, Yes. I can't get enough of him. I know his partners call him a jerk, but there's another reason for the nickname asshole. Sue was not in the mood for jokes. Mel, Henry is amazing and you and him are a great couple. Now is the moment when you should think about children. You're not in college anymore. Why are you with this guy? Mel sighed. Her friend was loyal. Although she adhered to more traditional notions of loyalty, she confessed to a friend, I know, Sue, Henry is amazing, and I don't want to lose him. David is an adventurer and a daredevil. We both love our spouses, but there is a strong attraction between us that we cannot ignore. Sue warned her, Mel, you need to think carefully about your actions. If you were really happy in your marriage, you wouldn't date your boss, and if he was happy, he wouldn't start a relationship with one of his employees. Mel was getting more and more tired of her friend's lectures. What part of the marriage vow did you not understand? She asked. Giving up everything else is pretty corny. Sue, will you cover for me or not if Henry ever asks? Mel continued. I will not give any information and I will never bring up this topic. But if he asks, I'll tell him that I was with you. Where are we sitting? Mel asked. In the front row, right in the middle. Thanks, Susie, you're the best, Mel said gratefully. Next weekend we will spend a day at the spa. I will be glad. Henry bought the perfect tickets. Sue couldn't help but think about it, as she had used the gift to trick him with David. Okay, bye, she said, and the words slipped through without difficulty. Mel hurried to her room looking forward to the evening's preparations. After drinking a few glasses of her favorite Pinot Grigio, she relaxed in a bubble bath and shaved her legs, and then carefully selected an outfit. Choosing a white lace bra and unbuttoning a few buttons on her blouse, she paired it with a skirt that fell just above her knees. She was wearing dark gray boots that complemented the vest perfectly. Thoughtfully given to Henry, she had just unwrapped them for the first time. Excitement clouded her perception, preventing her from realizing the irony of the situation. Looking at her reflection in the mirror, she felt satisfied with her appearance. Anticipating that she would turn heads that evening, she focused on one man. Calling a taxi, she drank another glass of wine and went to the concert, asking to make a short stop on the way. The driver readily agreed because the extra money would benefit him. They drove up to a gated community where Melanie gave them the code to enter. After driving a short distance, they stopped at the side of the road. Suddenly, David Miller, Melanie's boss, came out of the house and jumped into the back seat, warmly greeted his companion with a kiss. You look and smell amazing, Mel, he exclaimed. Let's skip the concert and go straight to your place. In response to his kiss, 
Melanie parted her lips and greeted him in a low whisper. Calm down. We'll have time for that later, she assured him with a smile. It's going to be a great show. The taxi driver, noticing a diamond engagement ring on her left hand, fell silent, watching her kiss and caress her lover. A cheater and a scumbag, he muttered to himself. Mel, for her part, never intended to betray her husband. They met on a blind date arranged by her closest friend. A strong sympathy immediately arose between them. She radiated friendliness and sociability, so they easily found a common language. Henry, on the other hand, was more reserved, but there was a quiet strength in him that attracted her. He never tried to outshine her, but she always felt confident in his company. His kindness, combined with a firm and wise character, did not match his youth. She found out that he had received a scholarship to college, which is a testament to his dedication and intelligence. After graduating from college, he devoted five years of his life to serving in the Marine Corps. This experience, as well as his reliable character, have given him a reputation as a specialist you can rely on. Mel found his sense of duty as attractive as his tall stature and rugged appearance. From the very beginning, Henry wasn't sure about Melanie's interests. He never considered himself particularly lucky or unique, believing that his duty was to take care of those in his circle, a lesson he had learned during his time in the Corps. At headquarters, he was taught that as the commander of the front line, he should always be the last to retreat. This lesson remained with him even after leaving the army and returning to civilian life. Therefore, he felt a little awkward when a beautiful woman started chasing him. The only time he felt out of place was when Melanie suddenly grabbed him and kissed him passionately, or gave him a look across the room that said clearly, I need you to figure out how to satisfy me immediately. Over time, Henry's fears lessened, and he and Melanie became closer. Their relationship blossomed and led to marriage after 18 months of courtship, which included a four-month engagement. Henry's communication skills and innate talent helped him get an excellent job at a firm in Austin. By his third year at the company, he was promoted to head of the department. By the fifth year, he had risen to the position of vice president of product development and customer support. Meanwhile, Melanie graduated from law school just nine months after their wedding. Melanie recently landed a promising entry-level position at a medium-sized firm in Austin, specializing in oil and mineral rights. Her impressive skills quickly attracted the attention of three partners, Connor, Sims, and Miller. But things went awry when Melanie became infatuated with David Miller, a 43-year-old married man with two teenage children. His wife, Diana, was the respected principal of the local high school, whom Melanie admired and considered the perfect match for David. She considered many aspects of her boss's activities mysterious. But one thing was obvious. Working for David Miller wasn't easy. As a senior partner, he worked at least 55 hours a week, which is much more than his two colleagues who worked only 40 hours. He required his team to work about 70 hours a week. After three years at the firm, Melanie finally switched to a 65-hour work week. Miller seemed pleased with her efforts and rewarded her with more challenging assignments. As they began to spend more and more time together, their communication grew from working to non-working hours. They began to prefer to communicate alone with themselves rather than with the rest of the team. Their relationship began to deepen as they began to communicate more closely and touch each other from time to time. Both knew they were entering dangerous waters. It took six months before their simmering attraction finally flared into a full-fledged flame. After winning an important court case, which resulted in a profit of about $2 million, David was to receive about $400,000, and Melanie was to receive a bonus of $45,000. To celebrate, a group of six employees gathered at David's office late at night. David was so happy that he even opened a bottle of his favorite bourbon for the occasion. When the party began to die down an hour later, David asked Melanie to talk to him alone. 
Sly smiles appeared on the faces of the most discerning guests as David escorted the last visitor out and quietly closed the door behind them. With a quick glance, he noticed that Melanie, leaning against his desk, had already begun to unbutton her blouse. Acting on instinct, David purposefully crossed the room, hugged her tightly, and kissed her fervently. Although David was not as physically imposing as Henry, he possessed a fierce determination that drove him to achieve what he wanted. He was a man who knew his worth and was not afraid to take advantage of the moment. He's been in love with Melanie for the last two years, ever since they started working closely together. His desire for her had been growing, and now it finally came to the surface. You're incredible, Melanie, David admitted, pulling away, allowing her to turn to him and wrapping her in his arms. I like our heated conversations, but I sincerely believe that there is something more between us. He spoke. I agree, David. I feel a strong connection with you that I don't want to ignore. It's not just a one-time thing. Although we are both married and intend to keep this marriage going, I can't help but hope that we will continue to have moments like today. I am very pleased to hear such words from you, Melanie. Although we both want to save our marriage, I also want us to have more moments like the one we shared. Six months ago, Melanie and David found themselves on stage during a concert, their hands entwined. Despite their hidden infidelity, they tried to see each other at least twice a month. But tonight, they didn't seem bothered by the possibility of being caught. They weren't too intrusive, but it was obvious to any observer that this was a meeting between two people who share a strong attraction. In Sioux Falls, Henry, feeling disappointed, decided to watch the concert live. If I can't be with her, then maybe I can catch a glimpse of her when they show the audience, he mused. When the FGL band took the stage and began performing four energetic and rousing songs, the atmosphere quickly heated up. The cameramen weren't very attentive to the audience until the fifth song, which was slow. When the camera turned to film couples in the audience during the love song, Cruise, Henry almost ran to the toilet. But he remembered that it was Melanie's favorite song and stayed in his place. In just 30 seconds, his world was destroyed and his marriage collapsed. The camera focused on the couple in the front row just where Henry bought the tickets, who were hugging. Dancing a slow dance and kissing passionately, they completely ignored the fact that they were being shown on the big screen. Henry immediately noticed Melanie in her new boots, which he had given her, and realized that the man she was hugging was David Miller, whom he did not know well. The sight of his wife in the arms of another man left Henry speechless, the pain of betrayal hitting him like a physical blow. He was dazed, dizzy, and gasping for breath. The camera switched to the other three couples and then returned to Melanie and David. This time, Melanie was the only one who stopped the kiss, and her eyes widened in panic when she saw them on the screen. Unable to hide her fear, she buried her face in David's chest, desperately trying to shield him from the truth. Meanwhile, Henry sat on the floor for 15 minutes, tears streaming from his eyes as he muttered, Why, Melanie? Or angrily exclaimed, Go to hell, Melanie. When he came to himself, he realized the urgency of the situation and realized that he needed to act quickly. Military training had taught him that inaction leads to death, and action and confrontation with the enemy give a chance to fight. Based on this, he began to act. Henry contacted his close friend and lawyer, Mike Lipscomb, who was stunned by the late call on Friday, and even more shocked by the unexpected topic of conversation. After apologizing to Henry, he had several repeat conversations to make sure Henry was sure it was Melanie. After making sure of this, he told Henry to hang up the phone, but to answer the upcoming call, which was expected within five minutes. As predicted, three minutes later, a call came from an unfamiliar number with the Austin area code of 512. Henry replied by introducing himself as Henry Kahn. The caller introduced herself as Erica Hamilton, Michael's lawyer and close friend. Hello, thank you for contacting me, Erica replied. Please call me Erica, and I'll call you Henry. Before Henry could speak, she continued, Forgive me for being blunt, Henry, but time is running out. 
You saw your wife at a concert with another man, and their intimacy was broadcast live, right? Yes, that's right, Henry confirmed. Okay, let's get to the details. Where were they sitting and what were they wearing as far as you remember? Henry quickly provided the necessary information. Please send me the most recent photo of your wife that you have. A private detective is on his way to a concert right now. He will arrive in 10 minutes and will be with them all evening and possibly all weekend to collect as much evidence as possible as quickly as possible. Henry, can you think of a reason to extend our stay in Sioux Falls for a few more days? We want to make sure that our evidence is solid and one night at the concert may not be enough to prove us right. If you can be delayed due to a snowstorm or make extra efforts for a client, we are more likely to catch them off guard. I apologize for being blunt. Henry agreed. Yes, I can do it. Okay, Henry, please send me a photo as soon as possible and stay in touch. I'll give you the latest news no later than noon tomorrow. Feel free to call your wife in the morning and let her know that you will stay at least until Monday evening. I'm sure your employer will understand you. As a senior vice president, I have a flexible schedule and can work with a client on Monday. Unfortunately, I have to leave now, but we can continue our conversation tomorrow. Henry appreciated the woman's quick reaction and actions, although he was still not sure of the result. Despite his dizziness, he recognized her competence. He barely fell asleep that night and decided not to listen to FGL anymore. By 4.30 in the morning, Henry had given up trying to fall asleep again. He got up from his seat and looked out the window. The snowfall began to decrease, but it still continued. Turning on the local radio, he learned that a lot of snow had fallen in the last 36 hours, which was a new record for Sioux Falls. It was clear that little would change before the end of the day, or even the next day. Henry took pen and paper to make some notes. Cheating was a common thing for him, whether it was the first or the hundredth time. He did not tolerate betrayal from family members. Not only was the betrayal disgusting, but the blatant disrespect they showed him was unfathomable. They openly danced and kissed in a public place in his own city. Even if only a few spectators witnessed their actions, gossip would undoubtedly spread. Have you heard rumors that Melanie Kahn is flirting with her boss behind her husband's back? He refused to tolerate such behavior. Remembering his role as her husband for the past five years, he realized that he could not ignore this betrayal. He had always been faithful to her, even though he was not attracted to other women. He hardly noticed anyone at all. His heart belonged entirely to Melanie, which meant he was unwaveringly devoted to her. They had disagreements, but he was a devoted husband to her. He was attentive, kind, and always took care of her, but at the same time treated her as an equal. He certainly didn't deserve such neglect. He compiled a detailed inventory of his assets and liabilities, and then a short list of people he needed to contact, his boss, his father, and two friends with whom he served in the Corps. Looking forward to talking to Erica, he outlined a plan for further action. Despite the early hour seven in the morning, he quickly changed into sweatpants and went to the hotel's fitness room for an intense workout that lasted until nine. After taking a shower and having breakfast, he finally picked up the phone. She sent two messages to ask how he was feeling and to express how much she missed him. She also mentioned that the concert went well and Sue accompanied her, another sign of disrespect. Even though Henry, as a Marine, knew he had to wait for his lawyer to sort out the situation, he felt compelled to act. In his opinion, inaction in a crisis situation was unacceptable. He picked up the phone and dialed a number. The line rang twice before Sue answered. Hello, Henry, she said. I heard you were stuck in Sioux Falls. The weather seems to be terrible. Hi, Sue. Can you imagine how much snow there is outside? It's a rare sight in Texas, especially in one day. I can't wait to get home. How can I help you, Henry? Sue sounded a little worried. I'm just curious, Sue. How did you like last night's concert? I really liked the opening song of the concert. This is how we roll. I watched the concert live from my hotel room. It was such a fantastic show. I know Melanie had a good time, but I really wish you were with us, Henry. 
Thanks for mentioning this, Sue. Before we end our conversation, may I ask you one more little question? I know you're a big fan of FGL, so I'm wondering how you could have confused This Is How We Roll with Up Down, the song they started with last night. How did this happen, Sue? There was a pause, and Henry continued. Sue, I cherish our friendship not only because of Mel, but also because of Jim, your husband. It looks like you've chosen a side and are willing to sacrifice our friendship so that she can continue her relationship with her boss. I don't know how Jim or I deserved such disrespect from you, but your betrayal has deeply hurt me. Sue felt a lump rise in her throat, and tears welled up in her eyes when she realized that she had made a mistake by covering for Melanie. A true friend will never put someone close to him in a position where he can be dishonest and harm others. I'm sorry, Henry, she replied in a barely audible voice. How long has this been going on, Sue? How long has David Miller been with my wife? It's been about six months now, Henry, Sue replied. Henry had expected something like this, but when he heard it for the first time, he still felt disoriented. He tried his best to keep his composure. Sue, does Jim know that you're covering for Melanie and helping her break her marriage vow to betray me? Sue sighed. No, Henry. Jim is completely unaware of the situation. If he found out about my involvement, he would be devastated and embarrassed. I promise not to reveal your role to Jim at this point, Sue. But when the truth inevitably comes out, he will have questions for you. Jim is a decent man, so I urge you to be honest when the moment comes. If I find out that you shared the details of our conversation with Melanie, I will not hesitate to inform Jim about it and make sure that he fully understands your involvement. To help Melanie accuse me of disrespect and ruin our marriage. Sue was already crying. No, Henry, I won't tell her anything. I won't even answer texts and phone calls over the weekend. I'll find a way to avoid talking to her. I'm really, really sorry, and I'm ashamed, Henry. Henry hung up without saying goodbye. On the other end of the line, Sue began to realize the depth of her stupidity, committed in the name of friendship. She realized that she needed to talk to Jim as soon as possible, preferably immediately. But before she could do that, Henry called Melanie on the phone. Despite her sleepy voice, she managed to flawlessly play the role of a loving wife. When she heard that he would not be back until Monday evening, she expressed slight disappointment. Although she was very happy, it wasn't like that without him. Her plans for the day were simple, to run a few errands, clean up the house, nothing special. She assured him that she would cook something special for dinner as soon as he returned home. The conversation ended with a polite, I love you, to which Henry simply replied, Goodbye. She thought his answer was strange, but she quickly forgot about it when David began stroking her female breasts, which delighted her. At 11.58 in the morning, Henry got a call from Erica on his cell phone. She quickly gave him the latest news and promised to provide a more detailed report when she called back at 7 o'clock in the evening. True to her word, Erica called at exactly 7 o'clock in the evening and briefly outlined all the information to him. The shooting at the concert was exceptional. The event was attended by a private detective who took a lot of photos. At first, Melanie was worried about the cameras, but as the concert continued, they returned to hugging and kissing. Back at Henry's house, the private investigator anticipated the result and discreetly installed recording devices in different rooms. The night was spent in passionate intimacy in the master bedroom. The next morning in the kitchen, they openly discussed the development of their relationship since its inception. They openly discussed the numerous sexual encounters that took place within the walls of the law office. They also developed a strategy on how to maintain confidentiality. After lunch, they returned to the makeshift bedroom for another extended session of intimacy. A private investigator followed them and documented their actions, but Erica expected everything to be the same. Curious about what Henry was thinking, she tried to figure out what was on his mind. He spent the whole day thinking and taking notes. Later, he discussed his thoughts with a lawyer, expressing a desire to end the marriage. For the past six months, 
she has openly and privately demonstrated her contempt for him. He believes that she must answer for her actions and the humiliation she caused him in the presence of loved ones. He insists that the truth be revealed without any exaggerations and excuses like irreconcilable differences. The facts should speak for themselves. I would like Melanie to be served at her workplace immediately. I hope his wife will be informed when I submit Melanie so that she can coordinate her husband's work at the same time. The same goes for David. I want his wife to be aware of all the information we have about him. I hope that during the divorce process, she will replace him. In addition, I want his colleagues to have higher moral principles than he does, and that they put pressure on him to leave the practice. If we threaten to sue the firm for repeated violations, it could push them in the right direction. I don't want to stay in this house. I need to sell it. There are too many memories here. To be honest, I don't even know if I'm going to stay in Texas. But I don't want her to live there. Hopefully we can split the shares 50-50 when we sell the house. I also want to protect all my assets. I don't mind spending my money on car payments or other small debts but I definitely don't want her to receive alimony from me. She had just received a large bonus, and the amount was already in the six figures. Erica asked some clarifying questions. She informed Henry that because of his high income, she would most likely receive alimony. But if the law firm includes a moral clause in the contract, they can use her infidelity as a basis for divorce, which may play in her favor. Henry planned to either stay in Sioux Falls or return to Austin and stay there until Tuesday afternoon. On the same day, Melanie was supposed to be handed legal documents. Erica hoped to find out before then if she wanted to participate in the case. Henry noticed that Melanie didn't contact him again until Saturday and early Sunday evening. Melanie and David must have been having a great time. Henry knew he had to get in touch with her, otherwise she might start to doubt. He called her at about 9 o'clock in the evening. Hi, I was thinking about you and realized that we haven't talked since yesterday. I hope you will still come home tomorrow. I can't wait to see you. I've missed you so much. I'm sorry, Melanie, but it looks like it's going to be Tuesday. I have some business at O'Hare Airport, so I'll be back around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Then we can plan a dinner together. Do you mind? She replied with annoyance. The next time I see James, your CEO and boss, I will have to tell him that there will be no more winter trips. He completely ruined the weekend we were supposed to spend together. Henry chuckled. Tell him that when you're ready. When you see him again. He thought to himself, Melanie, you've turned into a heartless and evil person. After a short conversation, Melanie confessed her love to Henry and then ended the conversation. Henry... I love you so much. You know that, don't you? She said. Henry, holding back tears, replied, Yes, Melanie. I know exactly how much you love me. With that, he ended the conversation, not wanting to embarrass her, despite knowing the truth about her situation. She will never humiliate me again, he thought to himself. Having dialed his boss James's number to give him the latest news, Henry was sitting at the kitchen table at exactly 3 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon. Not knowing when Melanie would return home, he received confirmation from Erica that the plan was going smoothly. Erica was supposed to serve someone between 2 and 4, and Mrs. Miller had already forgiven this man for two previous affairs with women who looked like Melanie. But she did not want to forgive the third, and hired Erica to represent her interests in this case. Henry Kahn and Diana Miller were named as plaintiffs in a civil lawsuit against Connor, Sims, and Miller. Erica doubted the possible success of the case, but there were rumors that Connor and Sims, although not saints, were unwilling to put up with unethical behavior that could damage their business. At 3.15, Erica called Henry and informed him that the necessary measures had been taken. While they were briefly discussing what to do next, Henry's phone was flooded with messages and calls from Melanie. Henry was in combat only twice, as his job in the communications unit was to provide combat support. But every Marine is trained to be a gunner. Twice in Iraq, he was caught in a firefight. The messages on his phone read, 
What the hell? How dare you humiliate me in my workplace? Answer me, you idiot. You'd better be home when I get there. I will never forgive you for this. The young lieutenant didn't stay in this position for long, but his captain, known for rarely praising him, quietly praised him for handling the situation well as a rookie. Henry's previous combat experience allowed him to remain calm and resolute while the confrontation flared up in the kitchen. Suddenly, Melanie burst in from a side door and demanded to know where Henry was. Henry was sitting silently at his desk when Melanie came up to him with a folder in her hands. She angrily threw the papers on the table. You heartless bastard handing me divorce papers at my workplace. How could you do this to me? How could you be so cruel and humiliating? Her voice softened slightly. Why, Henry? Why do you want a divorce? We love each other. We have a wonderful marriage and a promising future. What's on your mind? Please talk to me. Henry remained calm despite her emotions. It dawned on him that this was the first time he'd met Melanie since he'd learned about the shocking revelation on Friday night. Her eyes seemed tired and swollen, indicating nervousness. He noticed that she began to read the divorce application, but did not delve into the essence of the documents. Please sit down, Melanie. Let's talk about it, he suggested. Don't tell me to sit down, asshole. Who do you think you are? She replied angrily. Are you cheating on me with another woman? I swear I'll hurt you if that's the case, she threatened, looming over him. Henry has finally reached his limit. Standing up, he loomed over her with a stern expression, silently demanding obedience from her. Sit down, Melanie. Now, he ordered, his voice brooking no objections. Reluctantly, she obeyed and sat down in her seat. Did you even bother to look at the file attached to the divorce application? He asked, noticing how she shook her head in response but made no move to take the folder. Let's look at the events that led to the destruction of my world last Friday night. Let's start with the fact that here is a photo of you with David, who, as I now understand, is not Sue at a concert. It turns out that he is your boss, and in the picture you are both passionately hugging and kissing. Mel visibly recoiled from the table, as if the painting was a dangerous snake ready to strike. David, it's not what you think, she whispered. Hush, now it's my turn to speak. You will soon have the opportunity to verify this. The next item is a flash drive. I'm not going to play it right now, but it records your intimate activities with this man in our bed over the weekend. In addition, it records conversations that took place at this very table in our house, in which they discussed ways to keep Mrs. Diana Miller and me in the dark about your past and future meetings. For your information, I am aware of the distance between your office and another person's office. Miller also filed for divorce today. I do not know how she will solve the situation with her teenage children, because this is the third time he has been caught having an affair with a female colleague. However, this does not concern me. You knew you weren't the only one, right? Melanie was stunned by this information. It seemed to her that she was the only one with whom he had extramarital affairs. It turned out that he was not only an infidel, but also a skilled deceiver. However, given his profession as a lawyer, this should not be surprising. It seems that the extra pages detail the story of his infidelity, as far as Sue could remember. It became clear to her that his protection could jeopardize her marriage to Jim. As a result, she drew attention to the evidence presented by the prosecution from a legal point of view. In other words, she exposed his actions and revealed all the lies she was telling. A weekend trip with the girls last November was rigged to trick me and this jerk into going to South Padre, and I warn you right away, I would not contact Sue in the near future. Jim threatened to end their marriage if she spoke to you without him. Also, do you happen to have a copy of the civil lawsuit that Diana Miller and I filed against the law firm? Although making love to this jerk in our bed does not violate any company rules, it is worth noting that his desk, sofa, and private bathroom are in the lawyer's office. This is the foundation of our business. Our lawyer believes that we have every chance of winning. That's why I made the difficult decision to file for divorce, my dear wife. Your actions have broken my heart in a way that I cannot put into words. I was devastated when I had to go to Sioux Falls last week. 
because I really wanted to spend time with the woman I fell in love with and hoped to start a family with. As I sat and watched the concert, anticipating how my girl would sing and dance with her faithful friend Sue, my heart sank when I saw her in the arms of another man. Seeing how she longed for him, responding to his affectionate gestures, I tore my soul apart. At that moment, I realized that I was an adult enough person to realize the injustice and even the abomination of the actions committed against me. We are all imperfect beings, including me. You did not physically harm me, but only showed contempt. You deliberately shamed me in front of others, and I can neither forgive nor tolerate it. I refuse to stay married to you, Melanie, not for a minute longer than is necessary to complete our divorce. I will not simplify your task. I will protect as many of my assets as possible. Your loved ones will be aware of your actions, and I will not hide the truth from those who betrayed me. Now you are alone, and I believe that this is what you really wanted all this time. I'm done now, Henry said quietly. If you want to talk, do it quietly. She fought back tears, trying to keep her composure. Despite her strong and proud demeanor, the man she loved revealed to her betrayal and the consequences of her actions. She tried to shift the blame onto him, but deep down she knew she couldn't escape the truth about her own mistakes. Did you tell my parents? No, it's your decision. I talked to my boss and several colleagues at work. Apart from my lawyer and our company's lawyer, Michael, I haven't discussed this with anyone else. Nevertheless, I want to make it clear that if you try to hide the truth or downplay your actions, I will not hesitate to connect to them, including telling you about the contents of the flash drive. I can't tell my parents everything because it would devastate them. You can't despise me that much, Henry. Melanie, you have shown complete disregard for my feelings and for the fact that your actions have caused me great mental pain. Your behavior towards me has been disgusting for at least six months, and that's if you haven't had a relationship with someone else before. Please don't try to play the victim in this situation. I'm giving you a week to confess to them, otherwise I'll have no choice but to step in. They deserve to know the truth, otherwise I will provide them with all the evidence. Last Friday... You and Sue were supposed to go to a concert together, and you chose to spend the whole weekend in our marital bed with this jerk while confessing your love to me. It seems that every word that comes out of your mouth is a lie. I doubt very much that you are even capable of telling the truth in such a situation. Henry, I never wanted this to happen. It wasn't what I was aiming for. I was overcome by the excitement of winning the Dutton case, and I should have stopped it from the very beginning but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I can't even explain why. You really don't know why, Melanie? Henry rummaged through the folder until he found the right page. I'm sorry. I should have realized from our conversations how important it is that you be faithful to me, he said, recalling a quote he said two days ago when they were both lying in bed after intimacy. David, I can't get enough of you. We need to be careful. If Diana or Henry finds out about this, we'll have to stop everything and I don't want to stop being with you, he recalled Melanie saying. Yes, Melanie, your behavior does seem inconsistent, Henry thought to himself. I was not sleeping, but lying in the arms of another man in our bed, she confessed to Henry, calling her actions lovemaking and admitting that she never wanted them to end. Henry's words began to sink in, making Melanie think for a moment sitting in an armchair. After a short silence, she finally spoke, admitting that she had no excuse for her behavior as an adult woman who made an informed choice. She believed that she could hide her actions from Henry, but now she will have to face the consequences of her actions. I believed that I could participate in this game without consequences, even if you never find out the truth. I knew about David's unpleasant nature, and understood that our relationship would never be sincere, despite our declarations of love. My feelings for you have never been as deep as they are now, but I have shamelessly betrayed your trust and affection. Melanie paused to wipe her eyes and calm down, and then turned her gaze to Henry. At that moment, she noticed two important details. His wedding ring was on the table. 
She could tell by his eyes that he no longer belonged to her. The same contempt that he had once shown her was now directed back at her. The cozy world she lived in with her loving husband collapsed. Henry, I'm lost. I do not know what to do or where to go. I can't leave before the divorce. It would mean admitting defeat and financial ruin. I don't think you'll leave either. Can we arrange to stay here for a while? I need time to think about everything and decide on our next steps. I can't guarantee that I won't bring up the issue of divorce. Henry, at this moment all I want is to always stay by your side. The thought of you not being in my life is unbearable. I am ready to live in one of the available rooms and keep our communication to a minimum, only if necessary, as roommates. I will respect your privacy and personal space. Melanie, I understand that I cannot dictate your actions, thoughts, or decisions. My lawyer, Erica, advised me to stay in the house until the divorce is finalized, and she mentioned that you probably feel the same way. You're staying in the master bedroom tonight. I'm not going to sleep on the mattress that you and that jerk were having fun on. Tomorrow, I'll give it to the Salvation Army and buy myself a new one. This will be my bed, and you will never sleep on it. Thanks for understanding, Henry. I'll fight to stay if I have to, but I appreciate your cooperation. I'll start moving my stuff tomorrow while you're at work. Melanie stood up and tried to hug Henry, but he quickly pulled away. I can't believe you, Melanie. Please don't try to make physical contact with me anymore. Just being in your presence makes it hard for me to stay calm. You broke my heart and ruined what we had. I can't bring myself to comfort you after your disgusting act. You made your own decision, and now you have to face the consequences alone. I will never be able to completely erase the memory of your disgusting attitude towards me, Melanie. But I'm determined to do everything in my power to get you out of my life as much as possible. This process has already begun. Melanie sank into a chair, startled. She took a deep breath and laid her head on the table, tears streaming down her face. Melanie stubbornly resisted the divorce, clinging to a glimmer of hope that Henry would change his mind and stay. In order to maintain her self-respect, she understood that she had to resist divorce with all her might. Unfortunately, many of her friends have already turned away from her after learning about her actions towards Henry. In an attempt to prove her desire for reconciliation, Melanie asked the court to schedule counseling sessions for her, thereby demonstrating her commitment to therapy and innocence regarding David Miller. Despite concerns about the high cost of a lawyer's services, she decided to represent herself in court. After thinking about it, she decided to try it. She briefly suspended the process, but was determined not to abandon it. Despite the persuasions of Melanie's parents to let Henry go, they were shocked by her act and decided to support him, despite the strained relationship with their daughter. The divorce took seven months, and the property and savings were divided equally. Surprisingly, Henry did not have to pay child support, which was a good turn of events. Melanie decided to leave Connor, Sims, and Miller and start working at a small firm in San Antonio. On the day of the divorce, as she was leaving the house, she turned around to say goodbye to Henry. But he closed the door in her face before she could say a word. Now she rarely goes on dates, but on Fridays, she often returns home with a random guy, just to have fun. Perhaps communicating with people helps her to lighten her soul, or perhaps it serves as a reminder of the guilt that she left a good man and marriage. It was amazing to discover that Connor and Sims despite being lawyers, still have a soul. They eventually decided to kick Miller out, and he moved to Houston and got a job at a small law firm owned by his cousin. Unfortunately, Diana cheated on him during their divorce, and as a result, his relationship with the children suffered. The lawsuit filed by Henry and Diana was eventually settled out of court, as a result of which each of the plaintiffs received $250,000. Erica was pleased with this outcome. David Miller began to frequent the dilapidated Oilers Bar in the evenings, located in a disadvantaged area. One evening as he was leaving the bar, a man in sunglasses bumped into him in the parking lot. Ignoring the surveillance cameras, he closed David's eyes and said, Hey, asshole! 
after which he delivered a powerful blow to the face, breaking his nose and jaw. Standing over him, he made sure that David knew who was to blame for his injuries, as he spat out blood and a pair of teeth. I wanted you to meet my gaze and understand that this is inevitable. Now if you just report it, currently 12 former Marines are gathered in a bar in downtown Austin, many of whom are wearing combat vests decorated with medals. They will confirm that I was in their company all evening. If I am unfairly arrested and accused of assaulting you, one or two of them will come back to sort themselves out. Do you understand, worthless man? Charges were never filed. A year after the divorce, Henry was leaving a coffee shop in downtown Austin when he looked up and noticed an attractive woman about his age walking towards him. Holding the door for her, she thanked him and noted his good manners, calling him a cowboy. After answering politely, Henry headed for the car, but a sudden thought made him turn around and head back to the cafe. She was sitting facing the door and looked up when he entered the hall. When he reached her table, he held out his hand and introduced himself to Henry. She greeted him with a handshake and introduced herself to Lori. Nice to meet you, Henry. Why don't you take a chair and join me? That's how Henry's new relationship began. Melanie never found a suitable life partner, she was content with new acquaintances for one or two nights, who needed only intimacy and not a beloved woman and wife. That was the last story for today, my dear viewer. And I just remember, in case you forgot that I'm waiting for your royal likes. And be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next story. See you soon, my friend.